Good afternoon. Welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people here at this uh, first of a series of events uh, focused on the public good. I'm Elizabeth Castelli. I'm chair of the religion department here at Barnard and also a member of an interdisciplinary faculty committee that has created this public good initiative. I want to apologize that our fearless leader, Leanne Bell, who is Barbara Silver Horowitz, director of the education program here at Barnard, who was to be the moderator of this panel, has um, had a family emergency and so is unable to be with us today. So I'm just stepping in um, on her behalf. Um, I want to recognize the committee that uh, organized this event, which includes faculty from several departments and programs, English, psychology, philosophy, religion, women's gender and sexuality studies, economics, Africana studies, American studies, political science, Slavic studies, and education. So that's interdisciplinarity for you. Um, and I'm going to do a longer introduction of our panelists, but we're very uh, fortunate to have the president of Barnard here to give you a welcome. So President Deborah Spar. Thank you. It's, um, it's wonderful to welcome you all here, even those of you who live here, and uh, to open such a fabulous series of events. Um, I want to second Elizabeth Costelli's uh, notice of Leanne Bell, who unfortunately can't be with us this evening. But this has been a real labor of love for Lee. She's been working with, with her colleagues for a long time on this panel. And I know it's sad that she's not here with us, but I know she would be delighted just to see that you are all here and the panel is here and we are prepped for a wonderful evening. And a great thank you to Elizabeth Costelli, who has truly come in at the very last moment um, to moderate this evening. So this is exactly the kind of event that I think I love seeing most at Barnard because two of the things that I prize most about this college, and I think many of, of, of members of our community do, are its interdisciplinarity. And as Elizabeth just mentioned, it's hard to think of, a, of either an organizing group or a panel that's more interdisciplinary than what we have with us this afternoon. And also the extent to which both students and faculty at the college are truly engaged with the real world. So we're a place, like many colleges, that spends a lot of time on academic research, on scholarly work, on theorizing, all sorts of things. But then we also go out and engage in the messiness of the real world and spend a fair amount of time thinking about how ideas and theories interact with activism and politics and, and change, ideally. So it's really a wonderful confluence of engagement that I think sits at the, the center of what we're gonna be talking about this evening. It's hard, in fact, to think of a bigger or more relevant question than the public good. And just looking around the city, the country, the world these days, I think it behooves us all to spend some time thinking about what is the public, who is the public, and what is the public good? And it's a question, as noted in some of the background materials, that kind of slipped out of popular discourse for some time. Um, there has been a sense that the, the public good, or the good, if you will, is driven by, oh, by the neoliberal consensus and a focus on growth, and economic growth, as being the good. And the good that, in some ways, trickles down and affects all other kinds of goods. And while the economy was as strong as it used to be, um, it was easy to sort of push the bigger questions under the carpet and, and not think about them. But if there's one good thing that a bad economy brings is a moment, perhaps a long moment, an inflection point um, of reflection to think about what is the public good? What, who, does it, who falls under the rubric of the public good? How are goods distributed? How should they be distributed? What are the bads that come along with goods? Because there's few things in life that are unmitigated goods. So what is the cost of even things that we think about as good? It's particularly important to speak personally here for the moment, I believe, to think about these issues at a time when our country is being ripped apart by factionalism and fragmentation, the likes of which I've never seen in, in my political life, where the political Political movements seem to be pushing out to the fringes, and any notion of public good is getting perhaps tragically lost in the shuffle. So I can truly think of no better topic for a long, thoughtful, 
multi-paneled conversation. And of course, I'm biased. But I can think of no better place to have that conversation than at Barnard. So thank you all for being here. Thanks again to Elizabeth and the panelists. And uh, look forward to a great evening and a great series of conversations. Thanks. Thanks, Deborah. Let me just say a little bit about this broader project, and then I'll introduce the panelists um, for this evening's uh, discussion. For the Public Good is a multi-year initiative focusing on questions related to the public good. The global financial crisis that began in 2008 raises profound questions about the virtues of neoliberalism and the promotion of private market-based approaches over the public sector. The dominance of these views within public discourse has been accompanied by a concomitant decline in the ability to present an alternative discourse. In many respects, political discourse and political decision making have been weakened by an inability to, to mount a defense of the public good, let alone articulate what the public good means. So our goal is to examine the public good from a range of disciplinary perspectives in order to generate thoughtful and critical conversations that can counterbalance contemporary neoliberal discourses and that can suggest policies and directions that might better serve the public good. Questions that are going to be explored over the course of this project, and this panel just begins that conversation. In what ways do questions of public good arise in different arenas of social and political life? How do contemporary discourses frame the issues in these areas? What policy proposals arise from these different discourses? How does a focus on the public good intersect with the preservation of democratic political institutions and social equality? And these questions are going to be explored in several different arenas, including education, media, politics, science, the environment, and the arts. And tonight, we're really um, focusing more on um, education. So this opening panel's purpose is to provide a definitional and critical framework for the next three years of this project. The purpose of the panel is to provide an overview of issues and challenges in defining and enacting programs in support of the public good, to introduce the Barnard community as well as others to the scope of the project, and to develop critical linkages to individuals and organizations both within and outside the Barnard community for future conversation and action. Our panelists, I'm going to introduce all of them um, in the order in which they're going to speak. And so our first speaker will be Nancy Holstrom who is going to give us a kind of philosophical frame for the, for the discussion itself. She's chair of the philosophy department at Rutgers University, Newark. She's published numerous articles on core concepts of social political philosophy, including freedom, exploitation, rationality, and women's nature, human nature. Her edited book, Not for Sale, in Defense of Public Goods, with Anatole Anton and Milton Fisk, was published in the year 2000, contains a variety of essays aimed at developing a philosophical framework for addressing questions that crop up in contemporary controversies about public goods in the areas of education, welfare, environment, media, cities, and the prison industrial complex. And we've been reading in our faculty study group um, articles from this book. It's been very educating for us. Our second speaker will be Michelle Fine. She's Distinguished Professor of Social Psychology, Women's Studies, and Urban Education at the Graduate Center of CUNY. Her recent awards include the 2008 Social Justice Action Award from the Winter Cross Cultural, Winter Cross -Cultural Roundtable on Psychology and Education, the 2007 Willisteen Goodsell Award from the American Educational Research Association, the 2005 First Annual Morton Deutsch Award, and the Carolyn Sheriff Award from the American Psychological Association in 2001. Her recent publications include Revolutionizing Education, Youth Participatory Action Research in Motion, and Designated Others, Muslim American Youth Negotiating Identities Post 9-11. She will talk about the role of public education in democracy. Our final panelist is my colleague, David Wyman, who is the Alina Wells Hirshhorn Professor of Economics at Barnard College. He's also an affiliated member of Columbia University's Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy and the History Department. He specializes in 19th and 20th century U.S. economic history and the political economy of contemporary U.S. criminal justice policy. His research in economic history focuses on the evolution of banking payments and telecommunications networks. Since 2000, he has coordinated the Russell Sage Foundation Working Group on Mass Incarceration. 
He's the author of Barriers to Prisoners' Reentry into the Labor Market and the Social Costs of Recidivism, and co-editor of two Russell Sage volumes on the unintended socioeconomic costs of mass incarceration, a book entitled Imprisoning America, The Social Effects of Mass Incarceration, and another Barriers to Reentry, the Labor Market for Released Prisoners in Post-Industrial America. His current research locates the origins of mass incarceration in the turbulent decade from the mid-1970s to the mid-1980s, when local, state, and federal governments launched the war on drugs. He will talk about the critical role of government in supporting and serving the public good. The panelists are going to speak, um, Nancy's going to speak for about 20 minutes, the other two panelists for 10 to 15 minutes, and then um, we're going to open it up to a discussion um, with the audience with um, questions and answers. Um, I would encourage you to keep your questions brief and to the point and to keep them questions. And um, we hope that this will be uh, the beginning of a continuing set of conversations on the topic. I will just say, when we get to the Q&A, it's important for you to wait for a microphone to come to you because we're recording this event. and even though you think that you can be heard, um, the recording equipment can't pick you up if, if you're not talking into the microphone. So please be patient. There will be students with, with uh, wireless mics around to bring them to you. Um, I also I think many of you signed up when you came in um, on our mailing list. Please do um, after the event if you have not, um, so that you can learn about future events in this project. I'll just let you know that the next event in this project will take place on Tuesday, February 21st at 6 p.m. in the James Room, which is over in Barnard Hall. Um, Diane Ravitch, who's a historian of education and the author of The Death and Life of the Great American School System, will be speaking to us about public education. And her, the title of her talk is wonderful. It's called, Is a School a Public Good or a Shoe Store? <laughs> Food for Thought. So we'll hear from the panelists in succession. We'll open it up for a conversation, and then afterwards, behind the shoji panels, is a lovely reception. And so I hope that you'll stay and um, talk more informally um, with other people who are in the audience and also with the panelists. Thank you for coming. Let me know if you can all hear me well, or if you can't, just raise your hand. I probably should correct just one point, that I'm not chair anymore. Thank goodness. <laughs> um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the opening session of this wonderful project um, and uh, for the generous honorarium which I'm going to donate. I've had warm feelings for Barnard ever since I taught a course here several years ago at the invitation of the philosophy department chair, Mary Mothersell, who had been my undergraduate professor at CCNY, true public good, um, and she was incidentally my only woman philosophy professor. Okay, I want to start with a slogan from one of the big so-called anti-globalization demonstrations in Europe. Uh, which said, in protest against a world where everything has a price and nothing has a value. I could also use slogans from Occupy Wall Street, like, when did the common good become a bad thing, or end corporate greed. These slogans express what a commitment to the public good is about. For what do we mean by the phrase common good or public good? Firstly, they're used simply as a contrast with something that's purely for private good. More positively, I think that the phrases are basically summary phrases for the kind of society that we find, that we find valuable, or better, since we're inextricably part of the material world, for the kind of world or planet we want to live on. These should be the most fundamental questions in all debates about public institutions, tax plans, etc. Because how do you decide what's a good plan if you don't know the goal? And ultimately, asking about goals leads to what kind of society do we want? The phrase, the public good, also conveys the idea that it's something for all of us, something we can appreciate as a good for everyone. Now, on the dominant individualistic model, the public good can only be a summation of individual goods. But I think that's inadequate. People have goods or values like love, community, solidarity, which are inherently social. That is, they necessarily involve reference to others, and hence they're not reducible to individual goods. 
The public good has different aspects. For example, if one feature of the society we want is that our people are healthy, another and another is that people are educated, then these are features of the public good. And public goods, plural, then, are what contribute to those values. For example, a universal health care system is a public good that helps to produce a society whose people are healthy. A public education system helps to produce an educated population. Public goods are, by definition, goods accessible to all. And it's important to see that they're interconnected. For a decent education, children need health. They need food, shelter, and they need parents who are employed. A related way of conceiving of public goods is as part of the commons or common stock. Historically, the commons referred to land on which commoners had the right to graze their sheep, cultivate crops, or collect firewood. They lost century, these century old, centuries old rights through the process that was known as the enclosure movement, when the commons land was made private, enclosed by fences, hedges, and enforced with violence. Not surprisingly, the commoners saw the enclosures as theft of their land. Each one of them lost his or her individual right to use the land. Similar processes occurred around the world then and today as, commons, as people lose access to lands that had been held commonly for centuries. Now the fact that common property involves an individual right to property is obscured by the widespread equation of property with private property. But property, if you think about it, is not a thing. Consider property in stocks. It's a set of rights, and different kinds of property involve different rights. The defining right of private property is the right to exclude others, hence the enclosures. Today, we see the word commons used not only for land and other natural resources, but for cultural intellectual products as well, communicative space like radio waves or the internet, scientific knowledge, art, literature, music, all part of our common human heritage, contributed to, indeed created, by countless people around the globe, building one on top of the other. Hence, these are all collective human products, whatever the individual effort contributed to most recently. And that includes this talk. You're probably familiar with the phrase, the creative commons, to refer to the internet, of which the open sourceware movement is um, an expression. Again, the core notion in all these areas called the commons is of some good that's accessible to all. So when something that had been accessible to all or could be is made private, whether it be water or seeds or medicine or music, this can be conceived as an enclosure also, and some would say as theft. The fundamental question is who should have a right to use and control of these, these goods? All of us? or just those who profit from them and to those who can pay the price. Talk of the commons, that phrase, may evoke in your mind the so-called tragedy of the commons, made famous by Garrett Hardin and used to promote the dogma that only private ownership can protect natural resources. If they're held in common, the argument goes, everyone will just use as much as they want and they'll all be destroyed. That private property owners, and that includes not particularly you or me, but corporations bigger than most countries are the best protectors of the natural world would be a joke if it were not so tragic. According to UN assessments, almost two-thirds of the world's natural resources necessary to sustain life on this planet are being degraded or destroyed by human action, that is, principally by um, multinational corporations who are subject to few regulations, who plunder the resources and move on, dismissing the long-term social consequences as externalities. The alternative to control by private property is not no control, as tragedians of the commons assume. The historic commons were managed by the local villagers, and there are many other examples of collectively managed resources. Some such common democratic control is clearly where we need to go to protect the global environment. Now, yes, communities have often been profligate in their use of resources, but corporations are compelled 
by the competitive market system and by their stockholders to maximize short-term profit and to grow incessantly without regard to long-term consequences. So I think the risks are not comparable. Now to summarize what I've said so far, there are three important contemporary kinds of struggles for the public good or commons versus private gain. The first is over natural resources, like water privatization struggles in Bolivia or South Africa. Second, the struggle over intellectual property, knowledge, and culture. In both these types of struggles, the struggle is, in both these types of examples, excuse me, the struggle is over who should have access and who should have control. Thirdly, there are struggles over public goods and services, public schools, social security, Medicare. These programs, incidentally, have been theorized as a new form of individual property in that individuals have the right to draw on common resources. One could also include in this category of public goods laws enabling people to access the goods of society by protecting them from the power of private property. I'm thinking of occupational safety and health laws or anti-discrimination laws. In this third area, the struggle is over whether they should even exist. From Athens to Madison, austerity measures have taken the form of attacks on public programs and public workers. In the developing world, the story is similar but much more dire, as structural adjustment programs imposed by the IMF and World Bank demand brutal cutbacks from people who already live on the edge. These kinds of social programs were very hard won. Pierre Bourdieu has called them historic cultural achievements of the human race, like great art and science, to be protected just as strongly. Given the importance of public goods, sometimes life and death importance, it would seem the most rational thing in the world to work together to achieve them, since we can't achieve them individually. Yet paradoxically, the conception of rational motivation dominant in economics entails that this isn't so. According to this view, when an individual's behavior is rational, she aims to maximize her own utility, whatever that might be. It claims that most people act this way most of the time, and the theory is also normative because behavior that doesn't fit this model is called irrational. Notice the theory entails that both smoking and ceasing to smoke are equally rational because both are maximizations of utility. It also but generates puzzles as to how collection act, collective action ever takes place and how it could be rational. What they call the free rider problem goes as follows. Since achieving a goal doesn't depend on any, the efforts of any single individual, and since individuals will get the benefits regardless of whether they contribute, it's not rational for an individual to contribute. Yet, this is the problem, if many act rationally, i.e. free ride, the result is that no one will get what will benefit them all. They just accept this as an interesting paradox. <laughs> In my opinion, this theory of rationality has been thoroughly refuted, and yet somehow it persists. Amartya Sen titled his classic critique, Rational Fools. I would just add that rationality is the chief evolutionary advantage that, humans, that we humans have. So the fact that the model entails that thoroughly rational behavior would lead to this destruction of humanity surely ought to count as a reductio ad absurdum of the theory. Implicit then in discussions of public good is what model of human motivation, human nature really, is most plausible. I contend with Aristotle, not unique to me, that rational action can be unselfish as well as selfish and can include emotions and moral convictions. Instead, in, instead of starting from the standpoint of individual utility or profit maximization, it's more rational to start from the social standpoint. Now, of course, the conception of public goods I've just sketched is broader than that found in standard economics texts according to which public goods are those which cannot be private because of some inherent natural features. Adam Smith's paradigmatic example was of the lighthouse, uh, which couldn't be made private because there was no way, practically speaking, of making uh, the light um, available uh, for some, but not for all. Another feature, in other words, for excluding 
most, most ships. Another feature is that my use of the lighthouse does not limit your use. But what's public or private is not due to inherent natural features, as I think the above examples show, but it's rather a matter of political decisions and struggles. If technology can make our genes into commodities, no doubt they could figure out a way to uh, do this for lighthouses. The most fundamental problem, however, with this narrow technical conception of public goods is that it assumes that everything that can be a commodity should be a commodity. Should we accept this? Now, probably everyone here agrees that neoliberalism, our, the dominant ideology of our times, is wrong. It's not the case, as Ronald Reagan said, that government is not the solution, it's the problem. Actually, they don't believe that either. Uh, even radical proponents of laissez-faire, like philosopher Robert Nozick, support military and police functions, which, as you know, are already huge and would surely have to grow more huge if they cut out all other public goods. And most neoliberals are eager to have the government fund research and infrastructure helping, helpful to business. So their opposition to government is quite selective. Now, opponents of neoliberalism agree that many public goods are essential, not just those good for business. But this still allows for different viewpoints about their centrality of public goods to a good society. Most supporters see them as an essential adjunct when and where the market system fails. And some would stress that this happens often enough so that you'd need an extensive network of public goods. Others of us, however, would go further and reverse the priority given to private goods. If we do this and take public goods or the commons as the default, then it's privatization, enclosures, in short, private property that would need to be justified. Since this is a distinctly minority opinion, one doesn't hear much about, I'll say a few words in its defense. Why take public goods or common stock as the default? For one thing, because we doubt that public goods are secure in a world based on our current system. We see public goods attacked today that were won decades ago and thought to be secure, attacks that are necessitated, necessitated, that word is used, by competition from low-wage countries. It's a brutally competitive system out there. I've already discussed the ecological catastrophe resulting from profit-driven development. There are also logical, political, and moral reasons, I think. When the question of privatizing something is raised, what is being considered is common stock. So temporally and logically, common stock is prior. Furthermore, I would argue that our current system is antithetical to a commitment to human equality and to democracy. Recall that the essence of private property versus common property is the right to exclude others. Since all human beings are equal from a moral point of view, and all human beings have roughly similar needs, shouldn't the basic presumption be in favor of equal access to the world's resources? An equal right to decide how they're used. And hence, shouldn't the burden of justification be on those who would exclude? Now, I think that one can justify excluding people from some property, but all the major kinds of property which affect everyone on the planet for good or for ill these should be accessible to all and under democratic control. Especially today, when the polar ice caps are melting, shouldn't it be all of us who have the right to decide on energy policy, not just the big corporations? Obviously, this is debatable. <laughs> My chief claim is that the burden of justification should not be on those of us who want access for all, but on those who would exclude. It's not as if nature came with signs this belongs to just him, or that a god made some, everything for the 0.01% and not the rest of us. While the question of a morally justifiable system of property is admittedly not an immediate pragmatic one, being clear about it, I think, can guide our pragmatic reasonings. If we were to make common property the default, then we'd be talking about what the global justice movement refers to by another world is possible, and what many people have called socialism. 
But Margaret Thatcher famously told us, there is no alternative. Repeating it so often, it became know known as TINA, T-I-N-A. Is that true? Is this really the best humankind can do? Interestingly, if we believe it, then it becomes true. In conclusion, I'd just like to bring out the gendered dimension of this debate over public versus private. Any market system, by definition, has winners and losers. Women, to put it mildly, do not tend to be winners in the brutally competitive global capitalist system. Both in the market and in the family, women do more work for less material reward and less power. Within a market system, public goods like common lands where people can grow food for their family or public health care protect the losers to some degree. Thus, the more pure the market system, i.e. the fewer public goods, and the more extensive, the more the commons have been eliminated, the more dire the straits of the losers, mostly disproportionately women. With neoliberalism, the convergence of neoliberalism, the financial and the ecological crises, women's burdens have increased dramatically. Women-headed households are most likely to be impoverished, especially if they're women of color. Half of the women's migrants are women who come to work as nannies, health aides, and prostitutes. The UN reports that women will bear the disproportionate burden of global warming. In Africa, for example, they have to walk further for water. They're often ecological migrants, and they're disproportionately victims of war, uh, sorry, of wars over scarcer and scarcer resources. Key to a vision of the public good must be a broadening of the concept of security. Instead of the obsessive focus on intentional violent threats, which is a narrow and one could say macho sense of security, we must recognize that the biggest threats to human well-being lie in the lack of access to parts of the common, for example, clean water, which kills more people than all forms of violence, including war. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Michelle Fine. Um, maybe we can all just send our warmest best wishes to Lee and her family, who were, um, I guess, going through a hard time. So I'm very glad to be following Nancy because she said so much of what I wasn't going to but wish I did. Um, biology writer Janine Banis lectures on the mighty oak trees that survive natural disaster. Banis pulls social problems up by their roots and asks, how does nature solve this problem? She's a stunning writer. I highly recommend her writings. So she focuses on oak trees, the ones that survive Katrina, and she explains that standing tall, almost unbowed, oak trees grow in communities, large, expansive, bold, and they take up lots of space, so they appear to be autonomous. But while they appear to be freestanding, the truth is that they're held up by a thick, entwined maze of roots, deep and wide. The intimate underground snuggles lean on each other for strength, especially in times of natural and unnatural disaster. This is, of course, how I wish we could conceptualize the public good those always imperfect policies, practices, institutions, relationships, and social movements that root us in place and connect us across, that reduce inequality gaps, that inspire democracy, that recognize and sustain our shared fates among glorious differences. We can think about libraries, schools, highways, juries, environmental regulations, taxes, subways, social movements, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, as technologies that connect us, resisting the centrifugal forces that stretch inequality gaps and secure the enormous space between the 1% and the 99%. 
I spend a lot of time migrating between prisons and schools, and I'm interested in education as a capillary of democracy. And I understand it's, there's a lot of plaque in the capillaries, right? I've spent a lot of time writing about the plaque. But I want us to see for a moment education as a space of democracy, of capacity building, of shared fates. And I'm worried that there are neoliberal rodents chewing and gentrifying our roots. So let me take you 30 blocks south and 20 years back to Brandeis High School so we can witness how public policies are actively on our watch, redistributing money, real estate, opportunities, merit, despair, and bodies in ways that widen inequality gaps and threaten our collective well-being. It was 1988 when I, Michelle, sat in the back of Brandeis High School Auditorium and I cried, salty tears of joy and rage. 250 young people walked across the stage with flowers and corsages and cheers and the rapid lights of cameras flickering for the survivors. Mothers, aunts, fathers, siblings, grandparents gathered from the Bronx and Harlem, Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic to celebrate their babies graduating the high school. And for many of them, the first in their family. This was on the Upper West Side. My field notes read, I just want a moment of silence for the missing 500. In a school of 3,000, of course, barely one out of 12 ninth graders graduated. Where are the disappeared, I wrote. If this were a school of middle class white students, everybody would be outraged. What we tolerate for the poor would be unthinkable for elites. At Brandeis in the 1980s and certainly since, I learned that it was normative for black and brown bodies to drain out of public institutions without diplomas and that few would be alarms, alarmed. Progressives and conservatives would explain the leakage differently, racism and capitalism, poor motivation and bad mothers, but too many agreed that it was inevitable. Skip, skip, skip. Little did I know that in the late 1980s, the state had other bids on black and brown bodies. Mass incarceration was being drip fed into the darkest neighborhoods of New York. State coffers were quietly realigning budgets, migrating monies and bodies of color from schools to prisons. In 1973, the state's prison population was 10,000. By 1980, it doubled to 20,000. By 92, it more than tripled to over 62,000. Fast forward. In 2009, the West Side Spirit, how many of you are West Siders? Okay, the West Side Spirit, local newspaper, ran a story about Brandeis High School closing down, which is why I now use its name I never did before. Test scores were low and dropout rates were high. I told them that a long time ago and so did lots of kids and teachers. The current school population would be grown out and the new building would consist of four small schools, two non-selective high schools designed in late summer, early August, scotch taped together and hit the road in the fall. Fabulous people committed to making this work, but the time for planning, for growing a community, an intellectual community, was quite low. One second chance school for older students who didn't have enough credits and one of the Bloomberg <coughs> massagings of data is to have credit recovery schools where 45 year olds who don't have enough credits go and etc. Don't get me started. Um, and then the new Frank McCord High School which would take a year to develop. Um, it was the new high school for journalism and writing and it would be co-sponsored with Symphony Space and had an enormous amount of community support. Frank was the one to watch. Ironically, Frank and Louis Brandeis, two guys who knew better. His school was being redesigned for the newly gentrifying families of the Upper West Side. I joined with community activists, particularly the Center for Immigrant Families, and we were deeply engaged in wanting to assure that Brandeis's makeover would be democratic multi-ethnic, and there are many people involved in the McCourt vision who shared that vision. Most of the sessions I went to were cordial and seasoned with public commitments to diversity, but then a slippery discourse of white deservingness started to enter. It's familiar because I know it too well. Many of us in the room know it too well. I guess the schools will be for threes and fours, huh? 
Um, in New York City, children have numbers tattooed on their souls, one, two, three, or four, that reflect the test scores they've gotten that don't actually move very much, no matter what we do. So one parent asked, I guess the school will be for threes and fours. And another parent raised his hand and said, if we're serious about getting these kinds of students into this building, we're going to have to remove the metal detectors. A woman facilitating the discussion said, I don't know, the other schools are probably going to want to keep the metal detector, so perhaps we should use the um, back entrance. And soon the architecture of separate and equal was in the public imagination. A number of us spoke up. The school has betrayed Central and East Harlem for at least 30 years. It would be a cruel joke to clean it up, invest in transforming the school, and then opening it primarily for local elite children who can get threes or fours. That would, of course, just, just constitute another betrayal of black and brown students in New York. And we were assured by the Department of Ed representatives that no, 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 any child will be welcome into this school. They will submit attendance, grades, test scores, and writing samples in English, and the computer will choose those who are eligible, and then we will interview. Uh, but what about a preference for siblings or children of Brandeis graduates? No, 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 no. The building will be open to all children of the city using criteria that are demographically neutral. The Brandeis story is all too typical. It is not just a Brandeis. And it reveals the workings of race, class, gentrification, and a funny reclaiming of public institutions. Technologies of dispossession, high stakes testing, heavy policing, selective admissions, are mapping quietly onto teenage bodies as if they were demographically neutral. Redistributing opportunity up and despair down, colonizing dreams and overdetermining destinies. Perhaps one of the most unjust distributions among youth is the belief in a tomorrow, what Arjuna Padurai has called their aspirational capacities. So one might ask, when did public become a four-letter word? In the spring of 2011, we witnessed a dramatic fiscal, cultural, and ideological makeover of the public sphere, a grotesque shredding of budgets for public education and social services while millionaires and corporations enjoy tax breaks. Across the country, public officials have chosen to transfer the economic pain onto the already burdened poor and working class in drag as austerity. As if the economic crisis were natural and inevitable, as if we were truly engaged in shared sacrifice. On every measure of social life, inequality gaps are swelling. British epidemiologists Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett documents that is these gaps that are our greatest threat to our collective well-being. Not just the percent living in poverty, the gap between rich and poor predicts health, infant mortality, crime, fear, violence. It's the point that Nancy was making. We can't keep gating ourselves in. You must be feeling it intimately in this community. Former Secretary of Labor Robert Reich keeps reminding us that the wealthiest 1% own at least 25% of the privately held wealth, while law professor and scholar Michelle Alexander tells us that there are today more black men in prison than were enslaved in 1850. And the Chronicle of Higher Ed continues to report that financial assistance to higher ed is in serious jeopardy for low-income students, students of color, for those who graduate with incredible student loans hanging around their neck and inaccessible entirely to students who are undocumented. We are witnessing an erosion of shared public spaces with an ideology of these changes being necessary for the public good. We are witnessing what political theorist David Harvey calls accumulation by dispossession, which involves dispossessing someone of their assets or their rights. We're talking about taking away universal rights and privatizing them so that it becomes their responsibility. 
not our collective responsibility or the responsibility of the state. With my colleagues at the Graduate Center, we've been involved in participatory research with young people, documenting what we call circuits of dispossession, the ways in which being dispossessed from education bleeds into health, bleeds into criminal justice, bleeds into housing insecurity, right? And the ways in which dispossessing, har dispossessing Harlem is deeply related to the makeover of Brandeis, right? That these aren't isolated moments, but we need to be looking at the interdependence of wealth and oppression. The attack is well-funded. The obvious names are Koch, Walton, Broad, Gates among them. Rupert Murdoch and his new best friend, Joel Klein, are sponsoring what I think of as a Foucaultian nightmare or a tag sale, a discipline and punish twofer. You can demonize educators and their students while corporations sneak away with public funding subsidies whether it's after school or tutoring or for private colleges, there is an enormous profit being made as poor kids are being dispossessed. So as I said the other day, I take the train from Montclair every day and every day the conductor says, if you see something suspicious, say something. So I'm here to say something. There are five things, or six, or a hundred, five, I will say to you, maybe six, that I find suspicious. Um, suspiciously um, making over, or, or camouflaging the, the intense disposition we are witnessing, and suspiciously um, referenced as for the public good. So my first suspicion is calls for accountability, right? Those of us who have been involved in public education, community work, for decades we have been calling for accountability. But the language of accountability has been shrunk and has metastasized to testing, right? And if you raise up questions of inequitable resources, if you raise up questions of poverty or racism, racism you hear no excuses, right? So I, I can't actually go into this that much, but I want to say I'm really suspicious of calls for accountability because deep democratic accountability has been at the heart of progressive education all along. And I do want to say that last week, Obama and Arne Duncan announced a $185 million competition that would reward, you all know this, colleges for producing teachers whose students perform well on standardized tests. It is a slippery and bloody slope. The second, my second um, suspicion is around the word crisis. I'm happy to talk about this later. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote in the early 1900s about the ongoing crisis in the black community, but he also warned us to be suspect of when crisis would get noticed because it would be an opportunity for profit, right? He and Naomi Klein, I imagine, been great conversations about this, but I am suspect of crisis. I have a book coming out with Mike Fabricant on um, charter schools, kind of how did a social justice movement get colonized as a corporate makeover of public education. Um, and so much of the early charter schools work was located in a language of justice. And then suddenly there was this proliferation of, oh my God, a crisis. Right, Brandeis High School was a crisis. Brandeis High School was a constructed disaster, right? It was a dumping ground. It was an underfunded place where educators were trying their best. Crisis, profit, close, reopen as a selective school, no longer serving local children. My third suspicion is about the media images of education. Um, I worry, as many of you do, that over Thanksgiving and Rosh Hashanah and Ramadan and Easter, suddenly uncles who knew nothing about nothing knew about rubber rooms and knew about charter schools, that they were very good and loved Eva Moskowitz. And I'm a little suspect of how these stories circulate so quickly and the unbelievable innovations in public schools are rarely captured in the media except for Michael Winneret, right? We should send our money to him. Um, my fourth suspicion is, is that exit is the only possibility for educational justice. Um, I hear exit, the, uh, whether it's vouchers or charters or leaving the public sector, 
Um, it's a bad version of Plessy, um, but very much advertised in Superman. My fifth suspicion is about claims of austerity, and my sixth is about progress. As I said the other day, sometimes I think when I hear about progress, it's a typo for profit. Somebody's making money every time they announce that they have figured something amazing out to turn a terrible school into a great school. Um, let me just say that for-profit schools, if I have to do one dystopic advertisement, for-profit for higher educational institutions have 11% of the students, they are mills, but they have 25% of the federal, um, federal financial aid and Pell Grants. Right? They have an incredibly well-developed uh, lobbying. So public education may be a deeply, deeply flawed, highly uneven system, a work in progress. It is, however, our only chance for participatory collective sustainability. And so it is our work to deepen the roots and resurrect what John Dewey called the aesthetic as opposed to anesthetic, provocative poss possibilities of public life. And to be suspect of testing, to be suspect of zero tolerance policies, to be suspect of the hype around charters and vouchers and teach for America and drive by education. Because with each of those, we are watching the erosion of the public sphere. So I leave you with a thought from political theorist Hannah Arendt, where she argues that public is not a noun, it's a verb, and it has to do with the labor of la vida activa. Arendt takes the position that at its most compelling, public is a set of commitments, your commitments, our commitments, our activities, our labors, our solidarities, our disappointments, and our desires. To recapture the public good requires a recognition that those of us in this audience, those of us in higher ed, whether we're in public or private higher ed, in corporate or civic life, must take up the vita, vita active and stand with children all over New York City who endure over-testing and over-policing, stand with communities, educators, and youth from the more than 90 New York City public schools that are being phased out or closed because of these tests, stand with women and men in prison who have been denied access to Pell Grants since before 1995, since 1995, with Ohio educators who oppose Senate Bill 5 that would turn all full-time faculty into managers and therefore unable to participate in collective bargaining. Stand with high school students in Tucson, Arizona, who handcuffed themselves to the chairs of the Board of Ed in order to testify for Chicano studies and pregnant and parenting teens in Detroit who had to sit down in the street just to keep their school open. We must stand with the thousands and thousands of undocumented high school graduates who prayed for the DREAM Act. And we should stand with educators who are, even in these hard times, daring to imagine alternative to high stakes exams. In New York City, we have a beautiful coalition of performance assessment consortium schools. Stand with grandmothers in Chicago who had a sit-in and demanded a local school in Little Village. Stand with educators and um, grandparents in Philadelphia who opened the folkloric charter school for, Asia, for the Asian American community because the public schools would not cede the space. Stand with people like Nancy Cantor, the president of Syracuse University, who removed Syracuse from all of those international rankings because she, she said it was leading her university in the wrong direction. And tomorrow morning at 6 in the morning, you can stand with the young people in Zuccotti Park because apparently our mayor is planning on closing it down. I wish us all well. Thank you. So I just, uh, on behalf of the panel, thank you for your patience. Um, I will try to keep my remarks uh, brief um, so that there's some time for some open discussion, not just the informal discussion afterwards. I've entitled my talk, uh, Political Economic Perspectives on the Public Good. Although in reality, it's, as my students will tell you, I've been thinking a lot about Adam Smith recently. And so it's really thinking about um, Smithian perspectives on the public good and the limits uh, of that view that we've actually inherited. 
what is the public good? From its very origins, political economy has conceived this question in terms of a metaphorical boundary between a public and a private sphere. In the private sphere or domain, the realms of the economy and civil society, individuals or voluntary associations are entrusted to make choices about what is good or bad for themselves. They make these decisions, in other words, with regard to their own circumstances and their own interests and not that of others. The public sphere, by contrast, is a realm of collective choice in which we recognize our common fate, consider for what is good for society at large, not just for ourselves. We acknowledge that no individual is an island or that it truly takes a community to sustain each member. There are, of course, many forms of collective decision-making, in a participatory democracy such as ours, they must satisfy the condition of political equality. All members of society are full-fledged citizens, not mere subjects, and <clears throat> uh, with an equal say in the process of collective decision-making. Not only do we each have a right to express our views on the public good, but we are also obliged to recognize the same rights of others and to engage each other in meaningful deliberation over these, over these matters. Second, in the words of FDR, or to be more precise, as Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, no one is left out. The collective decisions cannot systematically favor some individuals and ignore or come at the expense of others. I'm grateful to Leanne for organizing this public goods initiative and this inaugural forum at Barnard. Like many of my colleagues, I joined the committee out of a concern for the direction of American political economy since the 1970s. Whether we know it or not, we have implicitly decided through our fiscal policies, that is our tax policies and spending policies, to shift the boundary from the public to the private sphere. This trend is evident in the declining shares of government spending in, total, in the total economy, or its obverse, an increasing share of spending on private consumption. As David Stockman, the head of the Office of Management and Budget in the first Reagan administration, candidly admitted, this policy of tax cuts was intended to, and I quote, starve the beast, a clear reference to Hobbes' Leviathan. And we can see its force today in the budgetary pressures to slash further vital government programs like Social Security, Medicare, and public education. My most vivid illustration, though, comes from the very beginnings of the tax revolt in California in the late 1970s, when I was a graduate student at Stanford. Through a popular referendum, Californians, by wide margin, passed Proposition 13, which curbed local property taxes and raised the barriers to raising state income taxes. Many of my neighbors welcomed the additional disposable income from their tax cuts but we're also shocked by its consequences. Shorter hours and layoffs at the local public library. This was followed by the deterioration of California's public schools. And today, the proposition in 13 induced stalemate over state income taxes is taking its toll on the California university system, which in my graduate school days included many of the premier research universities in the world. Americans, it seems, often fail to connect the dots that relate their taxes to the provision of valued public goods. To be fair, their reaction is too often an artifact of how the issue is framed. By way of a more recent example, I am reminded of a Bush-Cheney billboard in the 2004 election, which simply read, and I quote, because it is your money. The implication was obvious and echoed an earlier sentiment of Calvin Coolidge, who equated excessive government taxation with robbery. For those with some background in the history of political economic thought, you will recognize the voice of John Locke, not Thomas Hobbes. Locke argued that the principal aim of government is the protection of individual property, including the natural right of individuals to the fruits of their labor and their wealth, namely their private income. Locke, of course, recognized the necessity of taxation to support a civil order, conceived of a minimal state just sufficient to protect individuals' lives, liberty, and property. While Locke's influence on American political economy is clear, I would argue that our current views derive more from Adam Smith's potent rhetoric on the subject. 
Smith's views on this matter can be boiled down to two fundamental and rather paradoxical propositions. The first asserts, in the words of Bernard Mandeville, that private vices are in fact public benefits. Smith famously asserts this position in the second chapter of his Wealth of Nations when he insists, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher that we expect our dinner, but from his regard to his self-interest. In other words, we are more likely to sustain ourselves, our life, liberty, and happiness through the pursuit of our private, not the public interest. He elaborates this position in Book Two of The Wealth of Nations along rather familiar lines, which constitutes his moral justification for private profit, profit and inequality. According to Smith, wealthy individuals and capitalist enterprises motivated solely by their private interest for self-enrichment, to save, reinvest their earnings, and their judicious, in his words, productive spending will trickle down the income ladder to the benefit of all, in particular the least well-off. The frugal individual, Smith claims, is like the founder of a public workhouse, who better serves the less fortunate and ostensibly those entrusted with the public good. Smith's second argument is found in the same chapter. While he has contempt for the rentier, the landlord, who, and a quote again, who reaps where he has not sown, Smith's sharpest barbs are reserved for the government. Not only does he consider all public officials to be engaged in, I quote, unproductive labor, he also condemns the state for its rampant prodigality and misconduct. Even when its intentions are good, Smith tells us, state programs are unnecessarily extravagant with, and rife with errors of administration. Uh, yeah. So when Bush and Cheney averred that it is your money, they were simply following Smith's logic. Individuals are entitled to the lion's share of their income because they, not the government bureaucrats, know how best to use it. The Smithian logic has exerted a powerful impact on American politics, an impact that interestingly, interestingly goes beyond that felt in other equally capitalist countries. However, this logic falls short on two accounts. The first is more purely economic. Smith's argument rests on the premise that capitalist enterprises are occasionally prone to, and again I quote, misconduct. That is spending on, and again he uses the term, injudicious projects, yielding at best no economic value. But for the society at large, he claims, prudent and successful projects will more than offset the losses of the failed ones. From our recent experience on the roller coaster of two successive speculative booms and bubbles, the first in the IT sector in the late 1990s, and the more recent in the housing sector, we should be genuinely skeptical of Smith's prediction. Indeed, even in his own times, the private sector was prone to these bouts of speculation. When the self-interest of wealthy individuals and capitalist enterprises steered the economy way off course, and left untold economic and social destruction in its wake. Although not the first, John Maynard Keynes is perhaps the most prominent economist to point out this fundamental flaw in the classical vision. He argued, by contrast, that private enterprise economies were prone to what he called coordination failures, or in Marx's words, anarchy, in which the rational pursuit of individual self-interest results in collective decline, if not catastrophe. Keynes's remedy, we also know, was a strong state that could intervene decisively to put the economic ship back on course, but also to take the necessary steps to prevent further calamities. Only a truly public agency serving a public interest would have the necessary systemic vision to reckon the potential harmful consequences of unbridled pursuit of self-interest as important, it alone would possess the coercive power and financial capacity to intervene decisively um, when such intervention was necessary. Perhaps for political purposes, Keynes considered himself a moderate who only sought to save the private enterprise system from itself. In doing so, however, he undermined the Smithian 
classical justification for capitalist exclusive claim over their profits and in turn for persistent economic inequality. Implicitly, Keynes argued the private sector rested on a political foundation, which he, as did his contemporaries like FDR, conceived as a system of social insurance, a social safety net in more familiar terms. This policy regime, which ranged from automatic stabilizers to moderate economic business cycles, to regulations to curb socially destructive strategic behaviors, to Social Security and Medicare, to redress the inequities arising from the lottery of life would make the private sector tolerable but also socially viable. Even Smith recognized that without these critical public interventions, we would face a Hobbesian nightmare. The problem with the Smithian view runs deeper than just a Keynesian concern for coordination failure and its systemic consequences. It runs the risk of violating the precept of political equality which recognizes the right of all citizens to an equal say on the foundation, foundational issues affecting the very fabric of our society. Like many today, Smith believed that the magic of the market, that is a competitive, truly free enterprise system, would remedy a variety of social ills, not just inefficiencies in for-profit production. To take a particularly relevant example, he favored a more market-oriented approach to edu the educational system where effective demand, private interests backed up by purchasing power, would determine a school's curriculum, its faculty, and the like. In its most extreme form, which comes close to Smith's ideal, the government would give lower income households vouchers and allow them to buy educational services on the free market. While most jurisdictions have opted for more moderate reforms, such as charter schools, this so-called middle ground does not address the problem. Like a voucher system, charter schools increasingly rely on private funding, charitable donations from wealthy individuals or their foundations. And with uneven public oversight over these institutions, this regime gives donors a disproportionate say on how young people are being educated. In other words, it replaces the democratic principle of equal participation with the market principle of voting weighted by income and wealth. If schooling were simply a matter of vocational training and marketable skills, we might not object. But we do recognize that K through 12 and even higher education serves a vital civic function to prepare young people, and here I'm actually quoting a Danish charter on education, to quote young people for their quote, active participation, joint responsibility, and rights and duties in a free democratic society. In privatizing this decision, we are returning to an earlier period of American history when most middling and working people relied on corporate, not social welfare. And in our society where incomes and wealth are increasingly concentrated in the hands of the richest 1% of households, I wonder whether we are not entering a second gilded age, an era in which there was no difference between what was good for GM and what was good for the country. Thank you. We have lots of food for thought here, and because we're, we started a little bit late, and I want to make sure that everyone who wants to have something to say um, has their time, I want to just open it up right away to questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please raise your hand high, and someone will bring you a microphone. I'll call on you. <laughs> if I knew your names. <laughs> Here's a question. Here, someone's bringing you a mic from the back. Hi. Um, as a public school teacher, it's always seemed fascinating to me this idea of for profit education because, as someone who's inside the system, I can't see how a school makes money. Schools just eat money, right? Um, you, know, you have to pay your teachers, you have to buy books, you have to buy computers, whatever, whatever. And so I'm just wondering if you guys can give me some perspective on how, this, uh, how does it work that a school can make money? 
Um, because from my point of view, it's, it seems like you know, that, that's not possible. I, I've always known that it's a bad thing for schools to make money, but how does that happen? Well, I have a thought about what kinds of schools can make money. Like, I think a business school can make money, right? So there it's actually selling a product, really, to individuals who conceive the sort of value of what they're getting once they leave. Or similarly with a law school or, or it's, you know, medical schools may be more problematic. But, but I agree with you in the following sense, that, you know, a um, colleague of mine who taught for a long time at Williams College worked on higher education. Right, had this view of higher education he says, as, as part uh, church, right, serving a public function, and part um, car dealership, right, selling a product. And it's the, it's the church part that's the problem, right, that if we're going to carry out that civic mission, right, then in a way we can't truly uh, depend on selling a product at a price that would yield a profit. And so that element of education, which is certainly important for sort of undergraduate education, as obviously for K through 12 education, that would imply that you must rely on what he would call donative, that is some kind of you know, donation resources, and that would typically come, or at least historically has come from the public sector, although increasingly, as I said, it's coming from, from the private sector. So I have two different images. Um, um, New York State is actually pretty good about not allowing for-profit management companies to run charters. But if you go to, and there's plenty of money being made in other ways. But if you go to Ohio, they have um, what's considered a, um, a very loose charter law. So it's so there was a there was an article in a, a, sh a Cincinnati newspaper by a guy who said, you know, I own some buildings in a poor neighborhood. I couldn't rent them, and then I discovered this charter law. And so I could bring in 300 kids, I could get per capita money, I hired education, um, entertainment, education, management, EMO organization to run the school. So I'm getting seven grand a kid. I already own the building. A lot of the curriculum is online. Increasingly, we are going to see curricula, the, that's, that is what Joel Klein and Rupert Murdoch are working on, kind of the online, um, common core standards. So it'll be very easy to bring in cheap labor, undereducated, anybody have a child who's graduated from college recently? There's not a lot of jobs available. So a lot of young people are doing internships where they go to Boston, they go to Newark, New Jersey, they get room board, um, they get to live in the teacher's village, they work in the school, they get a really low stipend. So you actually can. Then there's the for profit higher ed which is an enormous scam. It was a scam when I was writing Framing Dropouts, and it's a much more protected and growing industry now. There's a, there's a for-profit college called American Public University, um, and Walmart is giving each of its employees 15% of the tuition if they go to APU, and uh, it's more expensive than the local community college, but the local community colleges in California as you would know, are just stuffed. They can't take any more people, so people want to go. So there are a variety, and they get federal money for folks, right? So these places, and they are highly, they have very, very high default rates. People drop out of those for-profit colleges, then they try to go to community college, and they can't because they've um, got a really high default rate. So we're watching the kind of for-profit thing operate on K through 12, as well as higher ed, but I will predict, and it's not my idea, that the moving all of the curriculum and standards work online is going to be a real, a real savings for schools. Uh, there are a couple of questions in the back over here. Hello. Uh, thanks for the fantastic presentations. I'm a doctoral student at Teachers College. Uh, aware of a lot of the challenges in education, but I see the challenges of the economy even uh, looming larger, if you will, when our own Department of Commerce has a target for number of college graduates that we need uh, that our economy can hold, if you will, 10, 20 years out. That's lower than what our Department of Education is even aiming for. So part of the problem seems to be whatever the new economy is called. My question is, who do you know of who's actually working to solve the problem of how we create 
these new jobs since the technology worked. And now there are just less slots, less good slots, a lot of slots at the, at the bottom for sure. But who is figuring out what these new uh, uh, slots are and, and, and what are they gonna be? That sounds like an economist question. Oh, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 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 I glibly would say at eight o'clock I'm going down to Bank Street to give another talk actually on that subject. Um, David, can you I, use the microphone? Yeah, so that, sure. I actually, um, I don't think we can say there aren't enough slots. I mean, it's a question, this is really a question of, of a decision making about how we allocate certain kinds of resources. I mean, just as a simple example, if you want to put people to work, you want jobs, and this is just even for uh, high school educated, somewhat less educated individuals, all we need to do is devote you know, significant public resources to reinvesting and rebuilding our schools and infrastructure, right? So there's a clear, there's clear public need. I mean, there's a Society of Civil Engineers has told us that you know, we've got trillions of dollars of deferred maintenance just on our basic infrastructure, and we know we probably have almost equal amount on our schools. Um, so that's one kind of, uh, kind of employment. I mean, and it, again, and I've actually I sort of, I've, just wrote a little op-ed piece a, a while ago on, on, on the New Deal. I mean, what was interesting as a model, the New Deal was not just about building roads, but it was also about building infrastructure that was, that was farsighted in a way that, was, uh, that, that paved uh, found the foundations for economic expansion in the post-World War II period. And you sort of see, you saw something like that in the you know, Obama stimulus package, admittedly too small, but had a vision of a set of new technologies and new industries that actually require individuals with significant skills, whether in manufacturing or other you know, technical areas, that again, that would have, uh, could have, would have been supported by this, this government financing, ultimately, you know, with some luck, that would have you know, caught on and, and sustained itself uh, sort of more rapid economic expansion. I mean, that was the New Deal formula. You know, it succeeded back then, the trouble is that these investments were, were actually too modest uh, to address the problem. Can I just say one little thing? Just that um, I remember Paul Krugman had an interesting article quite a few years ago about unemployment and um, just pointing out that maybe we shouldn't say it too you know, loud, but 4% is the normal, a good rate, a good rate, you know, that is good for the system, which means millions of people out of work, okay, just as the normal workings of our system. And now, of course, it's nine, and that's an underestimate, and worldwide, the same problem with young people, it's even higher. So, I mean, I can think of where jobs could <laughs> be made, but there seems some, you know, deep problem of uh, our global capitalist system. Um, jobs could be created, but they're not. And they seem to want to keep it, you know, um, at this rate, rather than the 4% that they used to want to keep it and make adjustments to keep it at. Question down here in front. Um, I'd like to come back to some points that Professor Holmstrom raised about um, expanding the the uh, the scope of uh, the public good. That is, particularly about corporations. What what what, uh, what concerns me is that you know we live in a world today where there are huge, ever huger and ever fewer uh, multinational corporations that control the whole world economy, and yet their decisions, uh, the the you know just the energy industry, the oil industry. The, the um, industrial complex of oils and autos and so forth have the power to melt the polar ice caps, to change the climate. But these people, their decisions are not up for a public vote. They're not up for public discussion. I mean, discussion, yes, protest in, in um, um, Wall Street, but, but they're not up for a vote. And I'd like to know, why do we not think that's outrageous and that we shouldn't have some vote on this? Maybe it didn't matter what corporations did the size of them in Adam Smith's day in the 18th century, but today, when a handful of corporations can melt the polar ice caps or, or control the whole world's food supply 
or mow down forests or eliminate species one after another, isn't it time to make, make uh, demands that, that the decisions the corporations make be uh, subject to public, not just scrutiny, but public decision to be made part of a public good that people can vote on these things to have an economic democracy? Is that a question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded like a comment, <laughs> as I mean, or a rhetorical question in a sense, yeah. right? Okay, um, right. I want to see where are other hands at this point. Okay, why don't we take several questions in succession, and that'll help us kind of pull it all together. There's a young woman in the back, and then a woman here, in almost the back and a gentleman over here. So we'll start with those three, all right? So as a public school teacher at one of Eva Moskowitz's charter schools, actually, no, don't worry, you did not offend me at all. I agree with what you were saying. But I'm just surrounded by these amazingly intelligent, young Ivy League graduates who are very passionate about teaching and really want to be doing exactly what we're discussing. And I'm just wondering, how can I have a meaningful conversation with them that gets them to think in the way that you are framing this discussion because I have so many arguments with my colleagues and I'm just wondering what do you say to somebody who comes up to you and says the public school system is broken? What are some ways that you start to engage them in a meaningful dialogue? Okay, we'll just get a couple more questions here, and then the gentleman in the back. Uh, I, I don't want to ask a question, but I did want to add a comment to the a previous something that someone said here about the profit, the profit motive. We have to keep in mind that the big money that is going into the whole charter movement and so on is not interested probably in getting dollars out of the school. They'll never get enough dollars to satisfy themselves. But what they do get it's an opportunity to control what education is yes. and what ed education can be and what the schools are supposed to be doing for America or for anybody else. It's, it's a tremendous opportunity if you've been in some of these schools and see the kind of narrowness, the kind of rigidity, the kind of test um, uh, structure that governs what children are being allowed to do or not allowed to do and how that shapes thinking or not thinking. So they have an opportunity to yeah. shape the future thinkers of America, in a sense, and everybody is buying into it, in a sense, at the moment. And so that's, that's a payoff that I think is right. very, very right. important for right. people who want to have control and who think that they can control. And just with this last point here is one of the things that's happening in all of these schools, particularly the charters, is that so many of them are peopled by people who are not into for teaching for a career, for a lifetime. Right. They're into, into it for a very short time, for exactly. an experience and a contribution. So maybe that's the issue you need to bring up in your school over there is, are you in here for the long haul and what can we do to get together to change what is going on and not just accept the status quo? That seems to me would be one of the things that we could do in these schools. Okay, thank you. And there, did the gentleman leave? Who had his hand up over here? Okay, there's a question down front. We'll take this question and then we'll ask the panel to um, respond to the question from the teacher in the back and perhaps reflect on this comment and then this question. I was just wondering, um, uh, as a, what do we do with the privatization? How do you challenge the privatization of education when it's sort of all around? So I think of professors of education who send their children to private school or to my students who are learning to who are interested in education, but who will go to TFA because that's the most likely way of them getting a job. Um, it feels like a really constricting force, um, and I'm not sure my own realm how to challenge that or how to work against it or what to do, I guess, when it's the only avenue. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So these two questions are kind of related to each other. Want to take a try at it? Uh, I, I, can, I can start. Um, So I try to take this position that we should take, have bifocals. You know, on the one hand, it makes perfect sense that young people, lots of my son's friends 
or in TFA or teaching fellows. We all have a niece who, right, who did six weeks during the summer who's now teaching special ed science in the Bronx, right? Does anyone not have that niece, <laughs> right? So, so we're all in this, right? And then she tells horrible stories because She's surrounded by other people who've been there for 30 seconds, and sometimes they have crazy principles, sometimes great. Everybody's acting a mess because the world, right? And so there's nothing, there's no, it's like a skeleton with no muscles or, so. Um, for me, I, I, the most benign way in is to ask the question, um, if you're in a charter school, to, to, to actually study the history of charters. The history of charters was that there were social justice alternatives like the small schools movement. They are public schools. They used to be an alternative within the public school sector. And then they became um, positioned in opposition to public schools. That's a very interesting turn. And I do think no matter where we are each located, we have a responsibility to think about the issues that David and Nancy were raising about what are we doing around common faiths? So, so this Saturday, the, the UFT is having a gathering of charter school educators, and I'll be there and Norm Fructor, and talking about, so what's the responsibility of charter school educators to be in coalition with public school educators and not let the movement of which they have been involved be co-opted as a corporate campaign against public education? So, so I have no judgments about people who end up there, TFA, whatever. The economy has not given people a lot of choices. But we do have a responsibility to think about the common good, right? And not allow lies to be told about public schools, not allow innovation to only be located in, char in charter spaces as if that were true. I mean, lots of the charter schools are just, as you say, militaristic and whatever. Some of them are fine. Most of them are mediocre. Lots are crummy, right? It, the, the, all the data, I, in this book I have like an obsessive compulsive chapter reviewing every study. It's just, it's a pretty mixed bag, but you wouldn't know that from reading the newspaper, right? Um, and you wouldn't know it if, if you didn't look at, do the ninth graders actually graduate? Yes, 100% of the graduates are going to college, but none of the graduates were in ninth grade. So, one has to begin to pierce it open. But I do think there's a question about what's our responsibility, no matter where we are, whether it's TFA, charters, to be thinking about the larger issues of who has access to schools, dignity, solidarity with other educators, solidarity with the communities in which you're located, right, and all of the children in those communities. Um, and I think it's all of our work to try to create those, because it's, it's pretty polarized in New York as perhaps you've noticed. Um, but I think we have to have some shared interests around what's it mean for all of us to be public school educators for all of the children and not to allow, I mean, for a while I was saying charters aren't really, they are public, they get public dollars. Mm -hmm. They, they are, presumably have public school kids. Lots of them are organized now in New York. And so these are like the small schools movement um, how, do we, how do we enable niche schools to be part of a stronger democratic commitment to public education? Can I ask a question and make a sh short comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the um, teachers aren't unionized, right? Yes, yeah, some of them are. In some, 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 some cases, but not others? Yeah. 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 Well, but that, it, that's a big motivation as, from what I've read uh, for starting them, right? In many places that they, they didn't have the right to unionize. That's, very handy. I'd just like to make one point um, about the problem that people raise, well, the public schools are terrible, I had no choice. Um, the same is true, you could see, um, criticisms have been made of this kind, uh, you know, of national health in, in, in England. Or, well, the post office, you have such long lines, I can just go to UPS or FedEx, et cetera. Um, I think you have to know the facts and the history, but you have to point out that the, given neoliberalism, they have systematically starved the public sector. Look at the parks, you know, if I go to the Central Park Conservancy or, you know, Battery Park, which is privately maintained, say, oh, this is so nice, it's so clean. Well, yeah, because they've systematically starved the public sector. So. 
Anyway, I like uh, Michelle's idea of bifocality. You make your personal choices where you want to go to the park or what you, where you have to send your kids to school or something. But uh, don't get just you know buy into <laughs> that it's inevitably this way. It was systematic, you know, just where the money goes. Do we have maybe one last question, Maria? Oh, you have to use the microphone. Sorry. <laughs> I wondered if you could comment on another, um, I guess, if you see something, say something. Flexibility. Uh, the new Obama approach to NCLB and uh, flexibility and if it has any hope of fixing something that's broken. Um, so, so the way I read the new waiver flexibility option is as long as you do all of the worst things in the NCLB, which is to keep testing kids, keep evaluating teachers on the basis of tests, have no cap on charters, we will give you the flexibility to not produce the outcomes that were, of course, absurd. But it seems like a funny decision, right? One might want to say, we have a set of standards that we could all argue about how one would assess those, and then you're flexible about how you get there. Right, which is what the performance assessment consortium's been asking for. You know, come, come look at our students. Let's, we have gone to Albany a thousand times saying, let's measure how the young people in the performance assessment schools are doing in college, after college, et cetera. Are they, are they selective, et cetera. But, um, so I, I do not think this version of the waiver, I just see it as a, as a, a re-inscribing of the worst aspects of NCLB requiring kids to be tested, and now the, the new normal of 40% of teachers' um, evaluations to be, be determined uh, by student test scores. This common core is going to be a new boondoggle. I totally agree with you that it is about control, but it is also about who's making money. And if we track the dollars around publishing companies, offline, online curriculum companies after this beautiful book called something like Producing Failure by uh, Jill Koyama. Huh? Failure Making Failure Pay, about like all the money that these after school programs are making because if a school is failing, they have to provide after school services and there's absolutely no accountability and people are making a fortune. So I, I think that they kept the most draconian um, as, as a gift for the states that will comply. But there is a, a, a major movement now of parents opting their kids out of high stakes testing. Um, and that's moving across the country, so. I wanna thank our panelists for bringing us together to think about. Just to, to point out that, that what they've done very effectively is help us to both have a critique of what's happening and also a, a reimagining of something different. The shoji panels are being removed. The reception is about to begin. I invite you to stay and enjoy a glass of wine, have something to eat, and continue this conversation. And come back in February to hear Diane's ravage. Thanks. Thanks for standing in.